uh, of equipment and furniture and the like. I remember years ago, um, and Harold and Lynette, they're, they're friends of fa my family's for years and years ago. Harold and Lynette might recall that back in the day when we were all at Nawi Baptist Church, um, the Nawi Baptist Church choir used to sing cantatas. Now, a cantata, if you don't know what a cantata is, it's like a, uh, a series of songs around a theme, and I think the theme at that point was Christmas, and they decided to take their cantata on the road, uh, and there was an Anglican church uh, about five kilometres away, and uh, the, our dear friends at the Anglican church invited the church choir to come and sing their cantata, and my father, um, Jeff, he, uh, he loved a cantata, my mother was in the choir, and uh, and our pastor, Mike Dennis, some of you may, may know Michael, um, he, he was there as well, listening to the cantata. And, and my dad thought it would be a great idea to get his old tape deck. That's just telling you how long ago the story was. Uh, his tape deck. Yeah, you go, <laughs> they're in the Powerhouse Museum, right? Um, and, uh, and dad proceeded to put the, the tape deck and press record on this, what he thought was just a regular table up the front. Whereas in an Anglican church, that's a, like a sacred sort of a table. That's, that's the communion table and you don't ever put something on the communion table that's not communion. And very quickly, Mike, our pastor, said, Jeff, quick, get it off there. <laughs> that's a sacred table. And my father, not knowing the difference, he said, well, just a regular table, mate. What's going on? He said, trust me, trust me. So I always ask if I go to move a, uh, a bit of the equipment in a church. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that Bible reading with us this morning from uh, Luke chapter 5. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, I love it for a whole lot of reasons, not the least of which when I grew up, we grew up in, I grew up in a fishing family. Uh, anybody uh, grow, grow up fishing for holidays or for recreation? Do you, do you guys like fishing now? You live in Bateman's Bay for crying out loud. <laughs> Come on, there's got to be some fishing people around here. Yeah, double hands up the back. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I used to love uh, fishing as a kid with my parents. We used to holiday at the entrance. Uh, some of you may know where that is on the Central Coast. It's actually uh, these days about half an hour up the road from where I live. Uh, so my family and I, we live on the Central Coast. And I remember on this one occasion how there's a boat shed there. It's been there for, I think, almost 100 years. And, uh, and my father had hired one of these rowboats, and we rowed out to our particular hot fishing spot. And, um, and there proceeded over the course of about three hours to catch, I think it was about, the total number was about 35 tailor. Uh, beautiful eating fish, beautiful fighting fish. And, um, and when we got back to the boat shed, the owner of the boat shed uh, was commenting on, on the catch of fish, and he said, oh, Whenever anybody came up to me to hire a boat and they said, are they biting today? I'd say to them, look at that boat out there for five minutes and that'll give you the answer. Because we were just pulling in fish after fish. It was wonderful. But the other reason I think I love this story is I've had the opportunity now to travel on a couple of occasions over to Israel. Um, and I've been out on the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. It has multiple names. The, the body of water that's spoken of here in, uh, in Luke chapter 5. Um, and I vividly remember as we were getting ready to go out onto the Sea of Galilee, they've got these boats that take out um, groups, um, there was a gentleman out there fishing, but not the normal way that I do with rod and reel, uh, he, he was using nets. And to watch this Israeli gentleman uh, getting his nets together and then casting the net out into the water, it, it just brought passages like this to life. It's one of those memories that I think I'll have uh, for many, many years. But beyond the memories of both here in Australia, fishing growing up, and, and when I've had opportunity to travel to Israel, I think what I love most about this story is what it says about Jesus' mission and our engagement in that mission. Um, every year across our country, Baptist churches, um, they focus in again on Jesus' mission and our participation in that mission. And part of the focus, as we've already heard this morning uh, from Lee, was to uh, partner with those who are going in a cross-cultural context. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that uh, toward the end of my message. Um, but in this story on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus really begins to describe uh, his mission and our engagement in that mission in a very unusual way. So um, I want you to imagine if you're in Peter's sandals for a moment. 
okay now the peter of luke 5 is not the peter of of acts 2 remember in acts 2 uh peter on the day of pentecost preaches this incredible message and do you remember how many people come to faith that day three thousand three thousand people come to know christ and this uh, as a consequence of the spirit using this one message now i've been a preacher for about 29 years now and i'll tell you the truth any day when you see 3,000 people coming to faith in Christ from a sermon you preach, that's a good day <laughs> when you're a preacher. When you're a preacher, that's a memorable day right there. But, there, but this, Peter, this Peter here, the, he's a lot younger, as it were, in his faith than the Peter of Acts 2. Or well, this is equally when we read in First and Second Peter, this Peter who is decades down the track at that point, who is an elder of the church, a respected uh, disciple and disciple maker. Okay? This, is not the, this is not, as it were, the Peter of 1 Peter, 2 Peter. This is Peter the fisherman. This is Peter, the guy who in all likelihood dropped out of synagogue school, probably uh, maybe somewhere between the age of about 7 to 13, somewhere around there, to go into the family business because he, he didn't have what it took to be a rabbi. This is, this is Peter who probably still can't get the smell of fish out of his clothes. This is this Peter that we're talking about now and Jesus says to this Peter from now on you are going to fish for people now I don't know about you but for many years when I read that when I read that verse it sounds kind of noble if, if it was a sinner if it was a movie that was being shot you know the camera would zoom in on Peter or zoom in on Jesus and there'd be kind of strings reaching this anthemic sort of uh, crescendo at just the right time when Jesus says that Peter's going to fish for people but if you're Peter the fisherman I would almost guarantee that at this point Peter's going wait what fish for people what on earth are you talking about like that what that makes no sense to me to fish for people how do you even do that well i love it that when jesus says to fish for people or in king james it talks about to catch as it were uh it, the, jesus uses a special word it's the greek word zagrero and that literally means to take alive or to catch for life that's what the word means there and the sort of fishing that peter is being invited into here isn't going to result in death as it does for the fish that he's been used to catching <coughs> This fishing for people is going to result in life for these people. But with that in mind, I think for Peter, there would have been some confusion about how to go about fishing for people, about being part of Jesus' mission of bringing people to life, when they were once experiencing death, to bring them into that space of life. And truth be told, I wonder if that's the case for some of us too. Maybe as we consider participating in Jesus' mission, for some of us, Maybe it's just been me historically. But I think for some of us, there's this notion of, I know I'm supposed to, but I'm not sure how. You know, people have been saying up the front of church for years and years and years, hey, we're supposed to go out there and make disciples, but no one's ever shown me how. Well, maybe for some of us, there's a deeper question. Kind of, I, I know I'm supposed to, but I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I'm together enough. I'm not sure I'm kind of super spiritual enough. To be one of those people that makes disciples of Jesus and if you're asking those questions possibly like Peter was then I've got some good news for you from this story from Luke chapter 5 you see written into this story are clues about how we can effectively fish as it were for people now it's not a complete fishing manual this story okay not a, it's, it's not one of those maps that you can get at any tourist information that say, here are the hotspots. You know, have you ever seen those when you go travelling? Maybe you're not into fishing like I am, but I always get that from the local tackle shop and it's got where the spots are. Invariably, they don't tell you the right ones because the locals want to keep them for themselves. Um, <coughs> but that's another story. Uh, but So this is not a complete fishing manual, but there are some principles in this passage about how we can effectively make disciples there's three of them of course there's three because i'm a baptist pastor um okay the first of these principles here is that we are all in this together we're all in this together 
Now we've all got a part to play. I mean, how many times have we heard those words out of the mouths of politicians over the last two and a half years with COVID? We're, we're all in this together. Yeah. But, in this, but if this story of Luke 5 provides any clues for fishing for people, um, then the first one is that we're in this thing together. Have a look with me at verses 6 and 7. Uh, in, uh, in Luke chapter 5, verses 6 through to 7. It says there, when they had done so, this, so this is um, uh, when they let down their net, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the net, nets began to break. So they signalled uh, their partners, which later we read is James and John, to the, the, uh, to the other boat to come and to help them. And they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Um, now the western notion of fishing is often you know with a fishing rod the fishing reel one at a time. The Jewish understanding in the first century of fishing was with nets. That's how they would go about fishing and it was a team effort and the picture here in, uh, in Luke chapter 5 is of Peter and Andrew uh, lowering the nets fishing, catching this huge haul, so they're working together, but then their partners, James and John, when they see that there is a huge catch of fish coming in, they call their partners over because they're all in this thing together. You have to work as a team if you're going to work, if you're going to fish rather, in this way. And one of the things that I love about church is that there is typically this diversity of people with a broad range of gifts and abilities and strengths and experiences. And when we work together, we accomplish more for the kingdom than when we try to go it alone. I was sharing with a few people just before service this morning that um, I'm only quite new in my role with the Baptist Association. Up until the end of last year, I was a senior pastor at Narara Valley Baptist Church on the Central Coast. Uh, and I've been pastoring there for 19 years and then had 10 years prior to that in other churches as well. Um, and what we found at Narara is that as different people got in the game, as different people began to use the skills and the gifts that God had given them, the kingdom would start to extend. And sometimes, to be honest, they were some of the most unlikely people. Let me tell you about Georgia. Um, Georgia's parents, uh, my wife Carol and I, some of our closest friends, uh, we were in a Bible study group with, um, with Georgia's parents and Georgia. It was a multi-aged Bible study group that we were part of with all of our kids. It was like an intergenerational thing. Now, Georgia uh, has Down syndrome um, and uh, she's a, a wonderful young lady. I think it's next weekend. We're about to celebrate her 21st, which will be lovely. Uh, but she's quite a remarkable young lady. Now, our society tends to relegate those um, who, who have Down syndrome to the margins and they're, they're sometimes uh, pushed to the sides and not really given a voice. Where at Narara, we make sure that Georgia could participate in God's mission and she'd do it amazingly. So there are two ways that Georgia would make a difference. Georgia would be on the front door uh, regularly on a Sunday welcoming people. Now, if you ever came to Narara and were welcomed by Georgia, you would remember it, okay? Georgia has this incredible ability to notice things about people and to compliment them. And so, you know, ladies are coming to, into church and she said, oh, welcome to church. I love your dress. And it wouldn't be like she was, you know, making stuff up. She would genuinely go, wow, what a beautiful dress. Or, or she, there, there'd be a guy who walks through and she said, welcome to church this morning. You're so handsome. The guy's wife had come and pull you a bit closer. No. <laughs> um, but, but, but she would mean it every single time. The only time I ever heard something that wasn't a compliment was directed toward me. Um, and that was... So, as I said, we were in this Bible study group together. We'd eat a meal to start with and then we'd do the study sort of time. And, uh, and I, my, and anyway, I was being silly one night, just having fun. I like to have a bit of fun. Maybe you've picked that up already. Um, and I was being silly, and Georgia laughing. She wasn't being nasty at all. She was laughing, going, oh, Craig, you're such a big jerk. <laughs> I lost it. I thought it was the funniest thing I'd heard. Um, but in addition to welcoming, Georgia also serves in our creche, uh, and so she loves little kids, loves, even at that age, the, the really young ones pointing these little kids to Jesus. And I go, Georgia's part of the team. 
Georgia puts her hand to the plow as well, puts her hand to the fishing net as it were, just like anyone else in our midst. There's another guy uh, at Narara, Josh. Now Josh heads up all our worship ministry, okay? Uh, he's a very good guitarist and, and for Josh, it's never been about, oh, we'll just play a few songs and, and, and move on. Josh has always wanted to provide a space of worship where people can uh, engage with God in that way, which is wonderful. But in addition to that, Josh also works as a senior physiotherapist at um, Gosford Private Hospital. He's quite senior in his role now. And Josh is not only praying, and I've really appreciated the emphasis on prayer that you brought to our, our, our service this morning. Thank you so much. Um, but Josh continues to intercede for his workplace, is regularly sharing his faith there. And the other thing that's fascinating, he's, he's in a leadership role within his workplace now and he brings biblical leadership principles into his workplace and the funniest thing happens when his boss or other team members are around him are going wow how did you know how to do that where did you get that from and he'll kind of go let me show you <laughs> and be able to point out where from the scriptures he's got that because there's so much wisdom for life and leadership within the scriptures i love josh he's part of the team He's, he's helping to see the extension of the kingdom of God, both in our capacity to worship God, but also reaching out to the local community. Let me tell you about Beverly. Beverly's not part of our church, but I know her very, very well. So Beverly's 86. Um, Beverly has been following Jesus uh, for pretty much all of her life. She lives uh, in uh, her home as part of a, a retirement village community, and sadly her husband passed away about six years ago. So she lives by herself now. And Bev and I talk every week and it's incredibly common for us to have a conversation that goes something like, well, well, Beverly will say, hey, Craig, can you pray for, it might be Beryl, for example, can you pray for Beryl this week? And I say, sure, what's the situation with Beryl? Well, Beryl's just moved into our retirement living community about two or three months ago and, uh, and I've had her around for a couple of morning teas just getting to know Beryl and Craig, she's so close to the kingdom. I really sense God's doing something in her heart right now. And, and this coming Wednesday, we're going to be sitting down and I want to talk with her a bit about the Lord. I want to share the gospel with Beryl. Will you pray for Beryl? Sure, I'll pray for Beryl. Then we'll, <coughs> then we'll have a conversation like the week later. And I'll say, hey, how do did, how did things go with Beryl? Oh, God's good. Beryl's come to faith in Christ. Beryl prayed to receive Jesus. She's now connected in with a little group that we meet with for reading the scriptures together. Uh, she's starting to come along to the local church that I'm a part of now. Um, and, and she's starting to get, you know, we, she's agreed to start, you know, meeting one-to-one -one for, for discipleship. Now, normally I don't call her Bev or Beverly because that's my mum, okay? My mum lives at Oran Park up in Sydney and for years now, She's been leading people to Jesus. She's 86 years of age. Um, and literally my earliest memories are of my parents discipling people in our home, leading people to Jesus. And yeah, to be honest, at 86, some people might say, not my mother, some people might say, well, you know, you've done your bit for the kingdom, take life easy, or bigger barns, whatever the scriptures say. Um, but no, she's continuing to reach out to people. And her, the way she does it is through hospitality. My mum is a great Baptist woman and she knows how to make many slices. <laughs> you ever notice that about Baptist women? They know how to make cakes and slices. There are my amen. Yeah, I can, now I get an amen. Uh, <laughs> but, but, that, but my mum has this incredible gift of hospitality. And, and when people move into their retirement living community and they know no one, my mum reaches out and just shows them the love of Jesus, welcomes them into her home. And then it, when the timing's right, not forcing anything down anybody's throat, when the timing's right, she'll say, share Jesus. And I have literally lost count of the number of people that my mother has said, Craig, will you pray for? And then the next week, they've come to faith in Christ, they're reading the scriptures, they're connecting in with the local church. It's uncanny, but it's so simple. It's just hospitality. It's putting on a few slices and some coffee and tea. All right. Um, so as we fish for people, we don't do it alone, we do this thing together. But there's a, there's a second clue in here about what it means to fish for people, of partnering with Jesus in his ministry. And this one might sound a bit weird, 
The second principle is we're all messed up. We're all messed up. We bring the humility and God brings the grace. Okay? I love Peter's honesty. In verse 8, it says there, when Simon Peter saw this, he, what did he do? He fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. That's his first response. What's he saying? I messed up. I messed up. None of us have earned the privilege of partnering with Jesus, have we? None of us have. It's by grace that we've been saved. None of us are deserving. We're all messed up. We've all done things that we regretted. We've made choices. We've made mistakes. I know I have, and I'm pretty safe in saying that all of us in the room. We've got things where we look back on life and we go, I wasn't right. I haven't earned salvation. I haven't earned being part of God's mission in this world. So here's the whole thing about the fishing for people deal. We don't do that from a position of self-righteousness. We do that as a fellow person who's messed up. We are one spiritual beggar showing another spiritual beggar where to find bread. That's who we are. And I love this image of Peter on his knees on the shore of, sea, on the, shore of the Sea of Galilee saying, I'm not good enough. I'm a sinful person. I'm messed up. You better find someone else, Jesus. You better leave. I love, I love the next words of Jesus. Did you notice them in the text? First, Jesus' first response, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I remember years ago, I, um, I was struggling with fear, if I'm honest. I was struggling with fear. And I, so I decided to do a word study in the scriptures on every time the Bible says, do not be afraid. And do you know what I found? that pretty much every time when God says to people, do not be afraid, right following after that, there is a declaration of his presence. Or God brings his presence to bear in a special way. And the whole idea is, don't fear because I'm with you. So you go, for example, to Isaiah 41.10, and it says there, so do not fear. Why? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed. Why? For I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And you see this all the way through the scriptures. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The Christmas story. Remember the angel rocks up to the shepherds and the shepherds are going, ah! And what does the angel say? Do not be afraid. Why? Because I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. A savior has been born to you, Christ the Lord. What is that? God has presenced himself with you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You see, Jesus' stock in trade is to take sinful people who mess up like Peter, like me, like us, and to extend grace and forgiveness, and then to invite them into partnering with him because he is present. He is with us. That's beautiful. The third principle is that we all need to take our next step. We all need to take our next step. We need discernment and courage. Uh, There's actually two next steps for Peter in this story. The first one comes when Jesus says, let down your nets. Uh, And in verse 5 of there it said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But, but, because you say so, I will let down the nets. So there was his first step was actually one of obedience, wasn't it? So, if I can be so bold, let me ask you straight up this morning. What's Jesus asking you to do when it comes to fishing for people? And are you doing it? Let's just put it out there. What's Jesus calling you to do about fishing for people? And what are you going to do about it? First step's obedience. The second step that Peter had was simply to follow Jesus, to spend time with him. And so you go to verse 11, and it says there, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. And maybe as you look to fish for people, to partner with Jesus, to see people experience life to the full, maybe your next step is simply to be with Jesus, to have a close abiding relationship with him so that you have a faith worth sharing, so that what you share comes out of a place of deep relationship with him. So I wonder what might be some next steps there for you around how you might engage in a deepening relationship 
with Jesus. Uh, now, I'm not sure what happens around here at Batemans Bay, whether there are Bible study groups or connect groups or growth groups, whatever you call them. I don't know if that's happening around here. Uh, it might be. Um, that might be an option for you. It might, be a, um, it might be for you to start to read the scriptures on a regular basis. I know that for me, since I started work with the association, my uh, commute to work is about an hour each way. And, uh, and so on, on my phone, I downloaded um, the Bible and uh, the audio version of the Bible and I listened to the scriptures uh, on the way down and on the way back. Uh, and I think it took me about a month to get through all of the New Testament and I'm currently in Deuteronomy at the moment and absolutely loving it. And I got through Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone writes off Leviticus. There's so much good stuff in there. But, um, but I got through Leviticus into Deuteronomy now, looking forward to Joshua and Judges. Um, but I, I don't know, have a think about it. maybe it's taking some time uh, periodically on a, like a spiritual retreat, just a time to get away and to, to spend time in prayer and in the Word. Maybe it's an accountability group that you might be part of. I don't know. But I wonder what the Lord might be calling you to in a deepening relationship with Him. Now, most of our attention this morning, in the message time at least, has been on our engagement in mission, us living out Luke 5, 1 to 11. But as I said earlier on, each year in Baptist churches right across the country, the month of May is, is a time when we particularly focus in on mission, particularly cross-cultural mission. Not that that means that the other 11 months of the year, we don't even think about it, but we, we want to keep coming back to that which is important which is engaging in God's mission. And um, when Lee sent through the, um, uh, the uh, project that you guys had at Batemans Bay for Danny and Beth Hunt this year, I must admit my heart lifted when I got that because I'm old enough to remember when Danny and Beth, when Danny was a student pastor at Nawi Baptist Church. So that's where I grew up. I remember Danny when he was first starting out in ministry at Nawi. Uh, and, and the other thing, I was just remembering this with, with Harold Lynette earlier, um, one of the first messages that I ever preached was down at Cootamundra Baptist Church. Now, Danny, not long after being at Nawi as a student pastor, ended up pastoring down at Cootamundra. Um, and I was in this young adult um, group called 18s Plus at Nawi, and they were, there were some of us who were showing some uh, giftedness in the area of preaching. And they said, okay, there's a sermon and there's three points to the sermon. Why? Because we're Baptists and there's always three points. Um, and uh, three, three different fellas, you each take one of the points in the message. And I was one of those guys. And it was largely because of Danny giving an opportunity to young preachers, as I was back then, like myself, that myself and a number of other, other people are now serving as pastors and doing this preaching thing far more regularly these days. So as I said, when I heard that Danny, um, uh, da Danny and Beth Hunt were your focus for mission, I thought, wow, what a privilege to be able to share a bit of their story with you and to champion them because they're good people. Um, now, Danny and Beth and I, we're all a whole lot older now. Um, so, Danny, I've been pastoring now for about oh, almost 30 years and Danny's got a few more years on me. And the beauty of this project is we're actually sending out seasoned leaders into this context where, like, there, there's, something, there's definitely something to be said for sending out young ones into mission and that's a great thing. But on this occasion, we get to send out someone who is a seasoned leader, someone who's got some serious runs on the board, um, in, uh, in church ministry in a range of different contexts in, in very small churches and in very large churches as well. So I want to commend to you um, that $2,000 target um, for, uh, for Danny and for Beth, working in Uendamu, Ali Karang, Willowara and Mar uh, Murray Downs. Um, they're going to be learning culture, language, and so they can hopefully bring some of the, the giftedness and the skills and experience that they've had and to work with our Indigenous brothers and sisters in some really wonderful ways. So I, it's one of these things, it, it, you know, I could, have got, I could have been asked this morning to talk about someone who I had no idea about, and that would have been okay. But when I saw it was Danny and Beth, I'm going, yeah, that's an easy piece of communication because they're wonderful. Um, and I believe that God's going to continue to do some great things through his servants, Danny and Beth. Um, so, 
With that in mind, I commend to you the uh, event. When have we got? The 13th of May, isn't it? 13th of May, right down here at 6 p.m. Be part of that. Um, I would not be at all surprised if this church actually went over the $2,000 mark, to be honest. Uh, that would not surprise me at all uh, it, were that to happen, and that would be a, a good, good thing. We, had, we actually we had a situation at Narara three years ago. No, it was two years ago. It was right, right, at the begi- uh, right in the beginning stages of COVID. That's right. And um, we had a target not that dissimilar uh, from this. And we, I must admit, we thought, oh, I'm not sure how people are going to go with generosity. We're in the middle of COVID. We're just starting with COVID and everything's locking down. And we communicated about this vision. We were supporting a family over in, um, in Malawi, it was, the Cranes. And, um, and by the end of the first Sunday of the month, uh, the complete target had been achieved. And so then we thought, oh, we've never been in this situation before. What do we do now? So we went back to Global Interaction. Well, now we're the Baptist Mission Australia now, they call it. And went back to them and we had a look down. Okay, there's another project for a similar amount of money. And by midway through the first week, that one was accomplished as well. We're going, hang on a minute. This has never ever happened. What's going on here? Uh, and we went back. We, there was a third target as well we hit by the end of the first week. And we went back to the church and we said, we've never been in this place before. Like... So we actually want to seek God and say, Lord, what are you saying at the moment uh, to us about our support within uh, the, the, um, the, people, uh, the people group in Malawi and Mozambique, the Yao? And that was, that was just an incredible time. We get to partner with great seasoned leaders. Uh, that was a wonderful thing. So as I said, all that to say, I commend um, Danny and Beth to you. Uh, and it's not out of a guilt thing at all. This is a privilege to partner with these guys. So, with all those things in mind, how about a lead you in prayer? Let's do that. Lord God, we give you thanks that you would think to include us in your mission in this world. We know that you could have done it completely without us. Uh, You don't need us in that regard and yet you invite us into the work of the kingdom to living out the gospel, to communicating the gospel in word, deed and sign. So we give you thanks for that. Lord, where we have missed the mark, we say sorry, we confess that. And Lord, where you are leading us forward, I pray that you would give us the courage to be able to simply say, yes, Lord, that we would be obedient to the next step that you have for us. 